Watch this. I have to open up or I'm going to lose everything I've worked so hard for. The bar is open, or at least it will be, before it's supposed to be. A Meridian bar owner says she's not doing it to make a statement, but because she wants to save her business. We can't get to museums, but we can bring them home, kind of. This stay-at-home mom is breaking the boredom by brushing up on art history without a brush. They always seem to surface during a crisis. Conspiracy theories are nothing new. In fact, they are the product of some very old psychology. We sit down for a session in subversive perception. It's a rally cry we've heard from several business owners across the board and across the state when it comes to the phased reopening of Idaho. We can't wait that long. We have no choice. So instead of going along with Governor Little's plan, some are choosing to open their business earlier than scheduled. At least one Meridian bar is ready to open next week, four weeks before stage four, when state and local guidelines say they should. The owner told Joe Paris it's either open up early or lose it completely. I can't afford to lose any more money. I'm 69 years old. I can't start all over. I'll lose everything. Like other Idaho business owners during this pandemic, Vicki Long says she's out of options. So next week on the 16th, she's opening up the Whitewater Saloon in Meridian. It's not been good. I've been a nervous wreck. Worried about everything. My bills still go on, but when you have no money coming in, it doesn't work very well. I'm losing $30,000 a month. That's a lot of money. Long says unlike restaurants, they can't do carry out at a bar. No, it's not like we can have car ops serving drinks outside in the parking lot either, you know. So Long and her staff are getting creative. There's a safe way for us to be open. What does that look like? The bartenders will all be wearing masks. Everybody will have their temperature taken as they come through the door. Their names will be written down. If there is someone who tests positive for coronavirus, Long says they will use contact tracing from their log to keep their customers informed. So if anybody that comes in the Whitewater happens to be tested for coronavirus and has it, I'll have a log of who that person was with at that time, and they can all go and get tested. Long adds that groups will be kept apart and staff will constantly disinfect and clean all surfaces. Drinks will also be served in a new way. Drinks will be served in plastic glasses. They'll only get to use it once, then it'll be thrown away. Do you have any fears of repercussions from the city of Meridian or the state of Idaho? Yes, I do. I don't feel that they should have the right to come in and take that license because I had to open to keep my livelihood going. Have you come up with like a, a max amount of people that would be allowed in your saloon? I have figured it out to be the tops is 60, the way it's spaced out now. If somebody does have a fever, they're not going to be allowed to come in. Hi, right, Joe Paris joining us now. Vicki mentioned, Joe, that she's losing about 30000 a month by being closed. Did she happen to say how much help she's getting from the government and the CARES Act during this? Yeah, from government funds, Brian, she's gotten just under $10,000, exactly 9800 And she told me earlier that the truth is that amount of money just isn't enough to cut it for her and her employees. What is the city of Meridian, though, prepared to do, saying knowing that she's going to open early? Yeah, I asked them specifically about that this afternoon, Brian, and uh, here's what they said in a statement, quote, we are enforcing the governor's order based upon the legal interpretation of that order. We are responding to all complaints in an effort to educate the businesses and also ensure what steps they have taken to be in compliance. If they are not to be open, we will advise them what the order states. That again from the city of Meridian. Brian, interesting to know they don't mention anything about losing licenses, no. but as you heard Vicki mention in the story, she is afraid she could lose her liquor license by opening next Saturday. Yeah, it's a possibility. ISP could walk in and serve her some papers just to kind of educate her at first, but again, We'll kind of have to see how this all goes from here if anything happens before stage four. All right, thanks, Joe. All right, well, when times get weird, like now, it seems like our response to those times, well, they can sometimes get weirder. Some of us are quick to explain away a crisis as a conspiracy. With COVID-19, it's been a long time of being locked down and a lot of us left alone with our thoughts and access to the Internet. This week, those theories have ramped up. Some new ones, some old ones. Like this question from Dennis, who asked yesterday, is it true the government reimburses each hospital $13,000 for each COVID death? 
Well, it's a question that was first brought up back in April and since has stirred up a lot of suspicions. And the answer, well, it isn't a simple yes or no. Yes, hospitals get money for COVID deaths, but those Medicare payments are based on fixed rates hospitals already get paid for other patients with similar respiratory illnesses. So no, it's not part of a sinister, sinister plot to inflate numbers or try to make money. But when that extra payment was first brought up, it was perpetuated on social media as a reason we are seeing high numbers of reported COVID deaths. And a lot of people just went with it. Conspiracy theories, they're enough to drive anyone crazy. So we thought we'd seek some professional help to explain. Maybe you've heard this pandemic was planned. If we activate mandatory vaccines globally, I imagine these people stand to make hundreds of billions of dollars that own the vaccines. Except it wasn't, as so many have already poked holes in that theory. But that's not the point. Why are some people prone to accept conspiracy theories as fact? There's what the psychologists call, referred to as confirmation bias. We have a very strong tendency to see those things in the world that confirm what we already think and believe. Okay, and to discount those things that don't fit into what we think and believe. In a group context, that's highly reinforced. It just makes life a lot easier if you start out with other people with a lot of shared assumptions. You don't have to be negotiating and discussing every little thing. But the key point is these perceptions are always partial. They're always partial. They're always incomplete. And each of these teams sees only the part, a part of reality. But each, each of those teams is convinced that, that the part they're seeing is all of reality. What is it about somebody's mind that would prevent them from looking for, you know, like sometimes the simplest explanation is the right one, the whole Occam's razor kind of thing. What prevents people from accepting the simplest explanation and not always twisting it into something more grandiose. There's a very powerful force inside of each of us to see ourselves uh, in the right. And, and there's a very powerful consequent force to distort our view of reality if necessary to keep ourselves in the right. And, and this is, again, it's just so, it's just so human. We've built a life around a certain viewpoint that, again, for all of us is partial. Uh, to, to abandon that is, is, is almost unthinkable. I mean, that's like jumping out of a plane without a parachute. That is, that is free fall. If I can't see the world like this, I can't imagine seeing it like that because those are all horrible people on that team and I'm not going to enjoy them. How can I possibly see the world? Well, Dr. Hoops, I think that kind of covers it. That's kind of what we're looking for. But this has been very helpful, and I believe our time is up. And I think same, <laughs> same time next week. All right, Dr. Hoops told us those extreme teams he talked about only make up about 8 to 12% on either side of the spectrum. But they are usually the most passionate about their perceptions, as you could probably guess. Most of us, we're kind of in the middle, and it's not so fun to be passionate about moderation. We've said it before, and we'll say it again. Before you like, retweet, or share something with your social media friends, ask yourself, does this seem reasonable? And sometimes the simple explanation takes a couple of simple Google searches. With fewer people popping in at the zoo, has that meant the animals are more acceptable to <clears throat> repopulating? While you're thinking about that, meet this woman who is recreating works of art with only the contents of her closet. Grab your phones and get involved in the 208. Text us your questions about today's show or what you think we should talk about in the next one. 208-321-5614. Make sure to include your name and the hashtag the 208. Be aware, we will read it and we may read it out loud at the end of the show.
Margot sent us a message, wanted to know about Zoo Boise and if the lack of people was livening up the love lives of the animals. Heard they were having some positive results. Seems logical, right? Why are they acting that way? I mean, tis the season. The time of the year for the untamed to turn... They're Twitter-pated. Yep, Twitter-pated. The whole wide world in love. It's spring, and suddenly there's no one around. No distractions. No visits from intrusive voyeurs or ogling outsiders. There's a Twitter-pated look on every face. Could make a consummate combination for confined consummation? Well, you'd think. Well, Margot, you'd be wrong. Zoo Boise tells us that's not the case. There have been no copulating capybaras, no procreating pandas, no mating meerkats. Love's just stuck you on the chin. But wouldn't it be cool if there were? Turns out they're just laying around like the rest of us. And probably just as annoyed with their quarantine compatriot right next to them. I know it all gets a little old. Surviving a six week stay at home order? Yeah. Got to try to bust up some of the boredom, don't we? Well, sometimes it takes some creativity or recreativity, as it were. While most of us are chalking up this time as a total loss, one mom from Wendell has been quite productive at reproducing classic paintings without the need for a color palette. Yeah, mostly about my kids. I do a lot with music. Memes, lots of, <laughs> you know. My name is Bridget Rendon. I live in Wendell, Idaho. I have three little girls, five and under. I'm mostly a stay-at-home mom. I do teach some piano and voice lessons on the side. That's pretty much what I do. I had a friend post an article. She's like, hey, let's do this in our group. One of the museums was doing an art recreation challenge. Got on Google and just kind of Googled pictures and I found one. The first one I did was the Frida Kahlo. She's got like a big white circle thing around her head. And I actually went into my kid's closet and I found a dress that had a white pinafore. And then she's also got a painting, I believe, of her husband on her head. I found a black eyeliner pencil that I had, so I just kind of drew it in my mirror and it's really rough. And I posted it on my page and just said, nailed it. I got lots of likes and people were like, please do more of these. Almost every day I started doing one. The little boy sleeping by the river, he's got a little lute and I play the flute. So I had a flute on hand. He's got some weird boot covering things. So I actually took an old shirt and cut off the sleeve. And then there's a dog in the painting and we don't have any stuffed dogs, but we do have a stuffed cat that was pretty close to the same coloring. I wanted to do a Picasso, so I found one and it has lots of colors and stuff. So I actually went to my backyard and got our sidewalk chalk. Kind of got it wet and, and brushed it on my face the best I could. The original painting is called Vanity. She's got like this red pillow looking thing attached to her head. I have this plate that says, you are special. I thought that would be perfect. I didn't know how to attach it to my head, so I ended up just like setting it back there and holding my head against my dresser. That was one of the harder ones to like keep all the elements in place. I did a Beethoven that people love. For hair, I stuck one of his gray polos on my head. That one was really popular. She's in a like a red robe and she's standing up. So I had like a red sheet. That was really easy. Her hair's really big and I didn't know how to do that. So I ended up strapping a stuffed bear to my head. It's a soldier and he's standing in front of his horse. I don't have a horse, but I do have a stick horse. I didn't have a helmet, so I used a pot for my kitchen and there was like a red feather attached to the helmet. And so I stuck a red spool of yarn on the handle and that was my helmet. I did one in a yellow dress. And that one I did in my backyard. She's under a, a blooming tree. So I had to wait for my peach tree to bloom. 
Um, I wore an apron that was my grandma's. And it just like the whole picture reminded me of my grandma. I started with the first one just as kind of a joke, just something to do, but it's turned into this really cool thing and it's helped me gain an appreciation for art and I start wondering about like who these people are. I have people that would message me, I got texts, I got phone calls that were like, these are so awesome, these give me life. You know, I thought it was funny, but people are like, these keep me going. I look forward to your posts and they're booing me up in this it's hard time right now. To find the joy in these moments and to create something or be a part of it in some way so that you can look back and at this time and just say, oh yeah, there, there were some good things that came out of all of this. A lot of good things if you check Bridget's Instagram page. You'd think she'd have an affinity, affinity for works of art, right? But she's actually more into music. In fact, she teaches music. So she's done about three dozen of those recreations so far. Could put up a few more between now and the end of this whole COVID crisis. We'll have to keep an eye on it and find out. But you can check them out for yourself on her Instagram page. And we're going to have a link to that in this story at KTVB.com. And she's right. They are funny and pretty creative. As always, Text line is always open to the 208. Whatever you're thinking about, share with us. Be part of the conversation. 208-321-5614. Your questions, your comments, your complaints, complaints, send us a message. Use the hashtag the 208 and your name. We'll read some of them. Could be yours at the end of the show. I know you've been hearing a lot about this, and that is a fantastic weekend that is coming up. So here we are, and it's going to happen. Uh, temperature for tomorrow is going to be up to 82 degrees. And then as you look at Sunday, 87 degrees. We'll have your weekend forecast. But you know, the highs today uh, made their way into the 70s for this afternoon, just barely. We started out about 5 o'clock. We had 70 degrees. Now we have 72 degrees for the high temperature there. And you can see many spots into the 70s this afternoon and a little bit warmer than that. 
Now, here's your weekend forecast. As you see, 82 for Saturday and then 87 degrees for the high temperature Sunday. And keep in mind, we're going to have some breezy conditions that will be around here as well. Now, this 73 that we had for today so far is four degrees above the average of 64. You see the low of 43 this morning is just about where the average should be. And just to point out to the far right, uh, that's the amount of precipitation, two one hundredths of an inch. I know it's the beginning of the month, but we got to get going on that. But we don't see a lot, possibly next Tuesday and Wednesday. So your northwest satellite picture is showing the clear skies here over the southwest valley. As we go out to a wider shot, this is the best part. You can see it's clear everywhere, uh, even out over the Pacific Ocean. Next storm comes in later Monday and Tuesday. That's a chance of a shower. So tonight, it's dry conditions and clear, as you see Temperature is dropping down to around 50 degrees. And then tomorrow, the high temperature is going to be up to about 82. That's the high temperature that I have. You're going to have a sunny day. Just look for some breezy weather for the afternoon. So there's your weekend forecast. Next week, Tuesday comes along. There's a chance of a shower. It brings the temperature down into the upper 60s to right around 70. I would say as we look at Tuesday, there could be some windy conditions there, as well as getting into Wednesday. So just look for that difference in the changes in our weather coming up. That's your forecast. You have a terrific weekend. We're going to be back with more in just a moment. All right, well, some of us are slowly getting back to work, and so maybe we're starting to pay a little bit more attention to our calendars than we have been. And maybe it's starting to feel more like Friday again, usually a day when we look ahead to what we're doing this weekend or even just after work. And we're going to get back to that again. Just hold on. But if you're not there yet, not ready to get out there, that's okay. As we've been doing occasionally on the 208, let us take you to the places you maybe haven't seen over these self-isolated six weeks or so. Today, we're taking a field trip to the Boise train depot and peering in on the koi ponds for some COVID calm.
All right, we're going to wrap up the week as we like to do on the 2-8 by wrapping it up with a look at some of your comments. This one went grocery shopping for the first time since this all started. Myself, store staff, few others wearing masks, following rules. The rest of them without masks seem not to care as if pre-corona days. What's the purpose of all this? And this one just sent in from Michael. Just cycled by Esther Simplot Beach. No social distancing going on there. Probably the next thing to close, they had some Parks and Rec people out checking it out. And I guess the purpose in all this is basically some personal responsibility. And I'm sorry you don't feel comfortable going out to the store right now. It is about other people protecting you from what they may be carrying around. I understand that. So that's their choice, though. There's no laws. It's not required unless some stores do for people to wear masks when out and about shopping. But again, it's about what you're comfortable with at this point in time. And yeah, unfortunately, if we can't abide by the social distancing rules, City of Boise may start closing down some of these parks that are for right now open. Where's the equal treatment under the law? Meridian Academy of Gymnastics has been open for three weeks. I thought gyms were phase two. And again, not a whole lot of teeth to these rules, but it's about personal accountability and it is an executive order, not necessarily a law. So as we've expressed before, we're kind of educating people right now, not really citing anybody as of yet. Currently unemployed people are making more money than they can make by going back to work, especially since they get that extra $600. What will motivate those people to actually go back to work from Vicky? We talked about this a little bit this week. Yeah, there's a motivation to kind of not go back to work because you get that extra 600. Some people making as much as $1,100 a week right now on unemployment, but that all comes to an end in July. So maybe that motivation is you do want to go back to work and have a job through the summer and the rest of the year. Hey, Brian, I love that you laid down on a couch during your interview with the psychologist. Well played. Keep up the good work on the 208. That's Tim in CUNA. That was Shante Alsalay's idea. And yeah, I'll take a lay down job anytime.